Psalm 102, beginning with verse 1. Those of you who don't mind standing for the reading of the Word of God, we ask that you'll stand now. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my plea. Don't turn away from me in my time of distress. Bend down to listen and answer me quickly when I call to you. For my days disappear like smoke and my bones burn like red-hot coals. My heart is sick, withered like grass, and I have lost my appetite. Because of my groaning, I am reduced to skin and bones. I'm like an owl in the desert, like a little owl in a far-off wilderness. I lie awake, lonely, as a solitary bird on the roof. My enemies taunt me day after day. They mock and curse me. I eat ashes for food. My tears run down into my drink because of your anger and wrath. For you have picked me up and thrown me out. My life passes as swiftly as the evening shadows. I'm withering away like grass. But you, O oh Lord, will sit on your throne forever. Your fame will endure to every generation. You will arise and have mercy on Jerusalem, and now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promise to help. For your people love every stone in her walls and cherish even the dust in her streets. Then the nations will tremble before the Lord. Kings of the earth will tremble before his glory, for the Lord will rebuild Jerusalem. He will appear in his glory. He will listen to the prayers of the destitute. He will not reject their pleas. Let this be recorded for future generations, so that a people not yet born will praise the Lord. Thus far, the word of the Lord, you may be seated. Because of my groaning, I'm reduced to skin and bones. I'm like an owl in the desert, like a little owl in a far-off wilderness. I lie awake, lonely, as a solitary bird on the roof. I'm withering away like grass. But you, O oh Lord, will sit on your throne forever. This is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we are so grateful for our pastoral care ministry being so intentional throughout the year, and certainly in the course of this particular month, uh, giving us things vital to our mental, emotional, and psychological well-being. Can we praise God for them? and? And so today, I want to address the matter of loneliness, overcoming loneliness. In an April 30th New York Times essay, Vivek Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General, wrote, we have become a lonely nation. He went on to write, at any moment, about one out of every two Americans is experiencing measurable levels of loneliness. That is independent of personality, independent of age, independent of socioeconomic status. Regardless of how well healed you are, how young you may be, loneliness can knock at your door. Loneliness is more than just a bad feeling. While it may include the feeling that one's social relationships somehow fall short, it is also the state of being socially disconnected. In a Big Think article entitled, The Loneliness Epidemic is a Myth, the authors note that even before COVID-19, about half of U.S. adults reported having experienced measurable levels 
of loneliness. And that, according to the 2021 American Perspectives Survey, Americans today say they have fewer close friends than they did in the 1990s. Fewer close friends. Imagine that. As wired as we are, people actually have fewer friends than they did before the advent of social media. R roughly one-tenth report that they have no friends at all. And young people ages 15 through 24 have 70% less social interaction with their friends. With social media having replaced in-person relationships, people have lower quality connections. Uh, they may be, by way of technology, better connected, but the quality of those connections are less. Spending more time online comes at the expense of in-person interaction, producing more wired but equally lonely people. Loneliness has been identified as a stronger risk factor for death than physical inactivity and obesity. Think about that. Being lonely does you worse than overeating, than being physically inactive. Dr. Murphy equates loneliness as being equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now, if you're not a smoker, that doesn't hit you very hard. But if you're a smoker, <laughs> chain smoker, you know that, that loneliness does more damage than that. People who are lonely have a higher risk of stroke, diabetes, dementia, heart disease, and arthritis. They are more likely to suffer from anxiety, depression, eating disorders, alcoholism, and sleep depression sleep deprivation. Have you felt lonely lately? I wonder how many lonely people am I looking at right now? How many lonely people are looking at me right now? Am I looking at someone in person and someone looking at me virtually about whom this poem speaks? I was once sad and lonely, having nobody to comfort me. So I wore a mask that always smiled to hide my feelings behind a lie. Before long, I had many friends. With my mask, I was one of them. But deep inside, I still felt empty, like I was missing a part of me. Nobody could hear my cries at night, for I designed my mask to hide the lies. Nobody could see the pain I was feeling, for I designed my mask to be laughing. Behind all the smiles were the tears, and behind all the comfort were the fears. Everything you think you see wasn't everything there was to me. Day to day, the poet writes, I was slowly dying. I couldn't go on. There was something missing. Until now, I'm still searching for the thing that will stop my crying, for someone who will erase my fears for the person who'll wipe my tears. But till then, I keep on smiling, hiding behind the mask I'm wearing, hoping one day I can smile. Till then, I'll be here waiting. Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, they put it like, if there's a smile on my face, it's only there trying to fool the public. But when it comes down to losing you, my baby, that's such a different subject. And then he says, don't let my coy expression give you the wrong impression, because, baby, I'm sad. <laughs> the tears of a, of a clown. Who's wearing a mask right now? And, you know, you can, you can have worn a mask so long that, that, that you forgot it was a mask that it's your actual face. No, your face is hiding behind mask. 
This condition of loneliness is not foreign to people of faith. It has nothing to do with how saved you are. How much oil you got over you. How much anointing you have. The people of God experience loneliness too. That's why it's right here in the book of Psalms. The psalmist describes his experience in verses 6 through 7. He says, I'm like an owl in the desert, like a little owl in a far-off wilderness. I lie awake, lonely as a solitary bird on the roof. We're not given the demographic particulars of the psalmist's life. We're not even told who the psalmist is. We don't know the age. We don't know the socioeconomic background. We don't know the marital or family status. Because whatever they may be, they are inconsequential in alleviating his mental and emotional condition. And friends, that's not so surprising, is it? The world can appear to be your oyster, and you still find yourself in mental and emotional distress, feeling isolated, anxious, depressed, and hopeless to the point of seeing death or even desiring death. Such was the case with Lance Banks, NBA executive who took his life at the age of 56 on May 3rd. K-pop star Moonbin at the age of 25 this past April. Country music songwriter Kyle Jacobs at the age of 49 this past February. Steven Twitch Boss at the age of 40 this past December 13th. Naomi Judd, age 76, took her life in April of last year, one day before she was to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. To the world, you can have everything going for you. And what they don't know is that you're wearing a mask. And hiding behind that mask is is mental and emotional distress and the feeling of isolation and loneliness. Listen to the descriptives from the psalmist. Distress. Days disappear like smoke. Bones burn like red hot coals. Heart is sick, withered like grass. Lost my appetite, reduced to skin and bones. Eating ashes for my food. Life passing as swiftly as the evening shadows. Do any of those sound familiar? Anybody ever been heart sick? Anybody ever been distressed to the point of losing your appetite? Troubled to the point of losing weight? Been in a funk such that the days of your life literally seem to be disappearing rapidly? Bailey M. Davis describes it this way in in her poem, Fragile Heart. My life is falling apart. Can't get rid of this fragile heart. Headache from all the tears, restless sleep, thinking about fears. No more happiness, no more tears left to cry. Good memories say goodbye. Broken love, broken hope. My fragile heart doesn't know how to cope. The psalmist's feelings are exacerbated by the fact that those who are present are ones of antagonism and hostility. That is, he he doesn't have friends around, the only people around are people who don't mean him well. They taunt, they mock him, causing him to feel as if God has abandoned him. But unlike Bailey's poem, the psalmist does not end with his loneliness. Listen to verses 11 through 17. My life passes as swiftly as the evening shadows. I'm withering away like grass, but you, O Lord, will sit on your throne forever. Your fame will endure to every generation. You will arise and have mercy on Jerusalem, and now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promise to help, for your people love every stone in her walls and cherish even the dust in her streets. Then the nations will tremble before the Lord. The kings of the earth will tremble before his glory. For the Lord will rebuild Jerusalem. He will appear in his glory. He will listen to the prayers of the destitute. He will not reject their pleas. The psalmist recognizes a larger context in which he can place his life. In other words, he does not end with what is true about his condition but he puts his condition within the context 
of what is true about his creator. But you, O oh Lord, that is to say, in the midst of existential antagonism and isolation, he says, I have access to a cosmic connection. In other words, he may feel as lonely as an owl, but like the owl, there is the one who created him, for whom he was created to have access and connection, unlike the owl, which was spoken into existence by the word of God's power, he was fashioned by the hand of God and made in the image and likeness of God. He was infused with the breath of God and became a living soul. He was made a little lower than the angels and crowned with glory and with honor. He was made to have connection and fellowship with his creator. And it is with this understanding that he could shift the tone of his thinking with the words, but you, O oh Lord. My friends, overcoming loneliness entails placing our existential isolation within the context of a cosmic connection. We have access to a connection with God. And let me help somebody out. It is not the quantity of the people to whom you are connected. It's the quality of the people to whom you're connected. The right one is better than the wrong four. The right one person is better than having the wrong four. And you can have the wrong four and go nowhere. But if you got the right one, you can go all the way. The difference between the Philadelphia 76ers and the Miami Heat is Jimmy Butler. The Sixers sent Jimmy Butler to Miami for Josh Richardson. Then they got Ben Simmons. Then they got Tobias Harris. Then they added James Harden. And where are the Sixers right now? The sum total of Josh Richardson, Ben Simmons, Tobias Harris, and James Harden have yet to produce for the 76ers what Jimmy Butler has produced for the Miami Heat. It is not the quantity of the people. It's the quality of the people. And if you got the right one, you can do more than having the wrong four around you. And I wonder how many of us are carrying the wrong four looking for them to do what only the right one can do. Not the quantity of those around you. It's the quality of those around you. And while the psalmist may be lacking in the number of people on earth, the quality of his connection to God and the character of God is what fills the gap. Here's why. A connection to God is with somebody who lasts. L-A-S-T-S. Lasts. Listen again to verse 12. But you, O Lord, will sit on your throne forever. Your fame will endure to every generation. With the psalmist overcome by the seemingly fleeting nature of his life, he cites the fact that God sits on his throne forever. That God's fame endures to every generation. You see, we overcome the anxiety of temporal disconnection, that is, disconnection from people in time, with the certainty of an eternal connection. God is eternal. And what that means is God is always God, and God is forever God. God is both always and forever. Uh, he, he was that before Heat Wave ever came up with the song. Always and forever. He is always who he is. And he is forever who he is. He is unchanging in circumstance, place, and time. That is to say there is no place where God is not all of who God is. There is not a circumstance where God is not all that he is. There is not a moment 
when God is not all that he is. God will be all that he is in every moment, in every circumstance, and in every place for as long as there is a, such a thing as time. And he will be all that he is when time is no more because he was all that he is before time ever came into being. He is forever God. That means he is forever good. He is forever mighty. He is forever wise. He is the God who lasts. And guess what, my brothers and sisters? He is the only one who lasts. He outlasts everybody. He outlasts everything. He proceeds, he proceeds, and he succeeds everybody. He lasts. He alone faints not. Neither grows weary. He, he alone neither slumbers nor sleeps. He alone is from everlasting to everlasting. He alone lasts. In other words, he does not faint. He does not fade. He does not fail. He lasts. He sticks and he sticks around. People come. People go. People live. People die. But God lasts. Sits on the throne forever, rules forever, reigns forever. A connection with God gives us access to the one who lasts. He is always available. He's always accessible. He's always trustworthy. He's always present. He's always ready. He's relevant. He's relevant in every generation. See, God is omni-generational. He never goes out of style. He's never out of date. He needs no upgrade. There is no better model than God. He's good in every season. In fact, every day with him is sweeter than the day before. You don't need a new car fragrance with God. He's fresh all the time. And for as old as he is, the ancient of days, he's always on time. His mercies are new every morning. That's the God that, that we have the privilege of having access to. God lasts. Connection with God connects you to the one who lasts. And what that means is he gives you the ability to last. Yeah. But the psalm is seeing his life as quickly dwindling away. He realizes, I don't have to dwindle away. I've got a connection to the one who lasts. And because God lasts, he says, he can last. The God who faints not, neither grows weary, is the God who gives power to the faint. And to those who have no might, he increases their strength. And while the youth may grow faint and weary, and the young men will utterly fall, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings as eagles. They'll run and not get weary. They'll, they'll walk and not faint. The weariness in loneliness is overcome by a sustaining connection with the God who lasts. Loneliness can wear you out. But when you know you've got a connection to somebody who lasts, you can, you can, you can make it through. Somebody can testify of God sustaining you. When you felt that your life was going away, when both the light and life seemed to go farther and farther away from you, you did not want to get out of bed because you did not see yourself facing another day. But while that was so, there was still a connection that you had with God, and that was a lifeline for you. And that somebody can testify the strength about that lifeline was not the strength of your grip, on him. It was the strength of his grip on you. Come on and tell the truth. You were just about to let go, but because uh, you, because he was connected to you, he is the one whose grip was stronger than yours. You were about to give in. You were right at the edge of a breakthrough and you couldn't see it. The devil had you, but Jesus came and grabbed you. He held you close, Lord. So you would not let go. And because God lasted, you lasted. And therefore, you can say, I'm here today. Lord, have mercy. Because God kept me. I'm alive today only because of his grace. Because the Lord kept me. Am I talking to anybody in here? Talking to anybody who knows that, that your lasting is because God lasts. 
He, he helped you last. He, he held you through the storm and he helped you last. He, he held you through the fire and he helped you last. He held you through your grief and he helped you last. You're here today because the Lord kept you and you've got the testimony of the psalmist. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my life and the strength of my heart and he is my portion forever. If it had not been the Lord who was on my side, I don't know where I'd be, but because the Lord walked with me and talked with me and told me that I'm his own, I'm here right now. Listen further. As the psalmist asserts the confidence of his connection to God, he says... You will arise and have mercy on Jerusalem. And now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promise to help. For your people love every stone in her walls and cherish even the dust in her streets. Then the nations will tremble before the Lord. The kings of the earth will tremble before his glory. For the Lord will rebuild Jerusalem. He will appear in his glory. He will Listen to the prayers of the destitute. He will not reject their pleas. There is a particular aspect of confidence to which we should pay attention. It is the timeliness of God. The, the timeliness of God as tentative as he previously described his life to be. There is now a confidence with which he speaks. His connection with God infuses a confidence in the midst of his tentativeness. In other words, his circumstances are still what they are. He's still isolated. He's still surrounded by enemies. But the Lord is still on the throne. And therefore, his life is still under the purview and reach of the Lord. And therefore, he starts talking about what the Lord will do. Verse 13 is the particular verse that reads, You will arise and have mercy on Jerusalem, and now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promise to help. I, I, I'll say that again. You will arise and have mercy on Jerusalem, and now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promise to help. You see, friends, there is the connection of the words will and now. Uh, there is a timeliness to God. And within God's timeliness, there is uh, immediacy. Uh, there are periods when God allows you to say will and now at the same time. There are, there, 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 there are some times when you can only just say will. But there are other times when God says within my timeliness, you don't just say will, but you say now. Lord have mercy. The, the psalmist grabs hold of that when he says, now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promise to help. Friends, we overcome the worry of our loneliness by connecting to the timeliness of God. Our relationship with God connects us to God's timeliness. Our times are in his hands and he has established the times of our lives and within God's timeliness there are certain periods when God moves with immediacy. There are moments where God says now. There are times when God says what he said in Isaiah 33 and 10 now I will arise. Now I will be exalted. Now I will be lifted up. Ah, in Isaiah 43. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Isaiah 48, 6. From now on, I will tell you new things of hidden things unknown to you. They are created now and not long ago. I'm just trying to help somebody understand that there is a confidence in the timeliness of God that will cause you to say now. That confidence in God's timeliness prompts him to say now. 
now and I want somebody to hear me within the within your spirit because I'm speaking directly to your spirit ah you've been saying will for a long time but God is letting you know he's putting immediacy in front of you and he's saying it's now time for you to say now is the time for you to do what you promised now is the time for you to come through on your word now is the time for you to make a way now is the time for you to lift now is the time for you to open it up and when you are able to say now when you have this confidence in God's timeliness it won't just cause you to say will it won't just cause you to say now but it will cause you to say then then, 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 with God having a time when God will say now, the psalmist has the confidence to say then. In verse 15, he says, then the nations will tremble before the Lord. When God does what he says, then these things will happen. Do you know what that word then is? Then is a word of hope. Hope. Whereas the despair of his isolation doesn't see anything beneficial in the present or for the future. His connection with God gives him the hope for a time called then. What he can't produce, God will produce. What he can't make happen, God will make happen. What he can't put into action and put into effect, God will afford. Because God is still on his throne and he's sure of God's timeliness and therefore because of that he is sure that God has a then because God's then is connected to God's when. When God says now then he'll see what he said. He can count on God's then because God's when because of then are tied to the God who lasts. You see God is able to say this is what is going to be before it ever is because he's already there and because he decides right where he is oh, what's going to be there he can say when and you can say then Lord, have mercy. God has established the when and I'm just able to say then oh, this confidence empowered you to face the future you may not be certain of much but you are certain that you have a connection with God who holds your future and that God is with you ordering your steps and directing your paths that God is with you sustaining you giving you what you need to last giving you what you need to endure giving you what you need to overcome he's lasted and you've lasted and you're able to say there's been nothing too much there's been nothing too hard there's been nothing too great there's there's been nothing too long. There's been nothing too complex for God. There's been nothing too difficult. There's been no height too high. There's been no depth too low. That has been too much for God. And why would we be surprised? Pharaoh and Egypt weren't too hard for him. The Red Sea wasn't too hard for him. Jericho's walls weren't too hard for him. Neither the Assyrian army nor the Babylonian Empire were too hard for him. The cross at Calvary was not too hard for him. Neither death, hell, nor the grave were too hard for him. He overcame them all and he's outlasted. He's outlasted Caesar. He's outlasted Nero. He's outlasted Napoleon. He's outlasted Mussolini. He's outlasted Hitler and Stalin. He's outlasted Hirohito. He's outlasted Bull Connor. He's outlasted George Wallace, uh, he's lasted through the Antonine Plague, the Justinian Plague, the Black Death, uh, the third cholera pandemic of 1852, the flu pandemic of 1889, the sixth cholera pandemic of 1910, the pandemic of 1918, the Asian flu of 1956, uh, the flu pandemic of 1968, uh, the HIV AIDS crisis of 2005, uh, and the COVID-19 of 2020 he's lasted through them all and because he's lasted my brothers and sisters 
sisters. Humanity has lasted. And I wonder, is there anybody grateful that you've got a connection to the God who lasts? Come on, don't fool me now. Anybody glad that you are connected to the God who has outlasted everything and has allowed you to come victorious through everything? Is there anybody here who can say, I'm glad that I am connected to the God who lasts because I've come through what I've come through because the Lord has been on my side. I believe that there's a praise to raise right now because of God being with you. Am I talking to anybody? Is there anybody who has a hallelujah in your spirit because the Lord has been by your side? Is there anybody here who can say it was not me, it was not my mama, it was not my daddy, it was the Lord God Almighty. He fought my battles. He healed my disease. He's lifted my burdens. He's seen me through. He's made a way out of nowhere. He's prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He has anointed my head with oil and my cup has run over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He is with me now and he's going to be with me until he takes me to glory. And when I see him, when I see him for myself, I must say thank you for being by my side. Thank you for never leaving me nor forsaking me. Thank you for being my God. Thank you for being my shield. Thank you for being my defender. Thank you for being my strong tower. Thank you for being my buckler. Thank you, Lord, for watching over me, for taking care of me, for making a way out of no way. But is happening on the inside of somebody right now because when you think of the goodness of Jesus and all mercy, all that he's done for you your soul cries out Hallelujah, I'm not alone. The Lord is my shepherd, goes before me, defender behind me, I won't fear. 